to Rivers Online. We're so glad you tuned in. We trust that you are well. Uh, we, we want you to know that we miss seeing you physically, but you're in our hearts and we pray for you every single day. Yes, church, it's quite hard to be at home and to be waiting and we're all working and we're praying, but we're missing you. We're missing services. And I think it's going to be amazing when we get back together again. However, today we've got a great time of worship. Our team has prepared for us. And I really want to encourage you to enter in, cast your cares upon the Lord. And really just as you sing, realize what you're singing and just enter in. I believe God's presence is going to wash over your soul and refresh you today. Let's go to the team and let's enjoy a time of worship together. Well, you're welcome to our online service. It's so good to have you with us. We're going to praise God. We're going to lift up the name that's above every other name. We're going to trust Him for miracles. And we're going to lean in. Amen. He's to the one who made the morning bright. He's to the one who taught the stars to shine. He's to the one who To the one who gave his love for mine Broke all my chains and set me free All right to the way To the truth To the life I live in the life you live Jesus is to me and above everything Yes, to all the things that your love has done. Here's to the way you walked away my past. Here's to the future and the things to come. Here's to my Savior's everlasting love to the world. He brought me in his love 
sons and your daughters thank you that we belong to you God we don't belong to this world we belong to you Jesus 
to take our lives, God. Take our problems. We place them all in your hands, Jesus. Have your way.
great time of worship and enjoyed the presence of God and that it's refreshed your soul. I'm going to pray for us in just a moment because many people are facing despair and challenges and are feeling a bit overwhelmed. And I want to encourage you from a passage in 2 Samuel where David mentions as a soldier and a man of war that the enemy was just a little bit too big for him. But he called on God and then he testifies and I hope that will be our declaration today 2 Samuel chapter 22 and verse 7 and he says in my distress I called to the Lord I called out to my God from his temple he heard my voice my cry came to his ears he says now this is what God did in response he reached down from on high took hold of me and he drew me out of deep waters then if you feel like that today maybe you feel like you're in a deep depression or in deep waters but then God answered his prayer and he says this, this is his testimony with your help I can advance against a troop with my God I can scale a wall in other words I can get over obstacles but there are three things here quickly David found that when he didn't have enough strength he could call on God God heard and God's a God who responds to us when we pray the second thing we realize in this passage here is that God is a God who rescues us when things are too big for us and when the enemy is too strong for us. If you're feeling that today, this thing is too big for me. I don't know if we're going to get through. Or what's going to happen to my business? What about my job? I'm not getting any money in. These are all the reports we hear from people. But I tell you what, let's call on God. And if a thing's too strong for us, we've got a God who's stronger. And then lastly, he testifies that God filled him with strength and caused him to be able to run through a troop of soldiers and climb over high walls. That's strength indeed after being in distress. If you have a need today, put your hand on your heart with me and we're going to pray together. We're going to believe God for his impartation and for him to work in every home and every family. Father, I pray in Jesus' name today that what you did for David you would do for homes, families, and individuals watching this online broadcast. I pray in the name of Jesus, your powerful and wonderful Son, that you would lift the hearts of people, that you would draw them out of deep waters, that you would meet their needs, that you would show them uh, your mighty power, that even when something's too big for them, you're stronger than that. I pray that you'd bless and that there'd be many testimonies of strength being imparted and provision being provided in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, there we go. Let's trust God together and let's go to the scriptures and be reminded of his promises. Now, we've got a couple of announcements today. And uh, we want to just mention a couple of important things to you. Firstly, if you need more information about our services, go on the website. If you're looking for service times, go on the website. The website has so much information on it and you can find everything you need there. If you know us at Rivers Church, Kids Church, um, Kids Zone is a ministry that's very dear to our hearts and we have not forgotten the children. Maybe you haven't realized it, but while you're watching Main Church, your kids can maybe be in another room uh, on a tablet and be part of what God is saying to the children at this time to encourage them. Always remember there's age-specific ministry that we provide and you can just guide your children and they can enjoy ministry with us today. Then the next thing is, although we're on lockdown, we still have youth running on Friday nights. So make sure all the young people um, log on and tune in and they've got some exciting things. And so go on the website again and keep in touch or go on Instagram and uh, become an Instagram user. Yeah. And there you can find everything as well. Fantastic. All God's Gorgeous Girls, next Friday, 24th, 7 p.m. Log on, tune in. We've got Sisters Night, and it's going to be different, but we are privileged to come into your homes and to minister to you and encourage you 
as the daughters of the living God. Don't forget to follow us on social media, as I said, on Instagram. And uh, you can keep in touch with everything that's happening. And it's such an easy way. You've always got your phone in your hand and you True. can know what's happening uh, online. And then our pastoral team is available to pray for you, pray for your needs. They've been busy all week as we have praying, bringing needs before God. And I'll tell you, we have seen some amazing yeah. miracles. Yeah. But now let's go to the offering. As we come around our giving today, it's important for us to realize that the church has needs. It has physical needs. And you know, when Jesus was on the earth, he had needs. He was the son of God in the flesh, but he still had physical needs. And when it came to Passover, he needed a meal and he needed a room. And so we're going to read from Luke's gospel, this passage in scripture today. Yes, we'll read from Luke 22 from verse 7. It reads, Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it? They asked. He replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters, and say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. So we can see Jesus had needs, even though he was the Son of God. And there are four things that come out as we read this passage and as we prepare to give today. First thing I noticed as I read this is the disciples said, you'll find a man carrying a jar, follow him. And you know what we need to do today is we mustn't follow those who don't carry the church. We need to follow those who are serving the church, who are carrying the burden. They are our role models. That servant would have been carrying a jar of water. He would have been serving that house. And what Jesus literally was saying is, follow that sort of person. Because they're the ones who provide for the house. You need to do the same. And the second thing we learn from this passage is that God expects the best. This man gave him an upper room, not one on the ground floor that was noisy. He gave him one that it says was furnished and he provided a meal. So we don't tip God and bring him our dregs. We give him the very best and we carry the house. The third thing that I realized when you read this is he, is he said to his disciples, go and say the teacher asks. Isn't that interesting? The teacher asks. And you know what? The disciples of Jesus today are still being sent and are saying to you, the teacher asks. In other words, God has need of it. And if you today feel offended or feel, oh, gee, it's always about money. No, it's not. Jesus still needs and his disciples are still asking. That's what the scripture teaches us. The fourth point here says, be faithful to what you have promised. You know, he must have had dialogue with the Lord. The Lord must have gone ahead and prepared this for him and his disciples ahead of time. And this man actually kept his promise, even though there may have been a demand at Passover for him to uh, let that room out to a bigger group of people. Uh, maybe there could have been more money that came his way. But what he did was he held on to that prearranged promise that he made with the Lord and what God wants from us is he wants from from us to be faithful in our giving in our tithes and in our offerings and many of us have made that promise to the Lord we said Lord this is how we're going to honor you this is how we're going to uh, empower your house to be a light on a hill to touch the community now in this particular time this is not the time for us to forget our pre-arranged promise that we've made with the Lord but this is the time where we hold on to that and honor our Lord with our giving so let's do what we read in this passage let's follow those who are carrying the house and uh, let's remember the teacher is asking us let's give our very best and our prearranged commitment to tithe and to give offerings, despite the change in circumstances, needs to continue. 
You'll see on the screen there are various options, various ways that you can give by direct deposit. SnapScan is the easiest. Get into the habit of getting the Rivers app, then you can just open that. You don't have to worry about running up to the TV and trying to get a shot of it. You can just open the app and you can log on and you can give and it's so convenient and we appreciate your giving. God appreciates your giving and I know the Lord is going to reward you. Let's pray right now and let's uh, give and let's believe God for a wonderful blessing on our lives. Father, thank you for every giver, every faithful person who's keeping their word, keeping their promise and giving their best. We thank you for those that we can follow who carry the house. Bless them, reward them, meet their needs, provide for them both now and beyond this lockdown. In Jesus' name I ask, amen and amen. Now we've got to record a testimony of a wonderful couple, Clayton and Natasha. They've been through some challenges. They're a faithful couple at Rivers and God has done something wonderful for them. Let's have a look. Well, hello church. We trust that you have enjoyed the service so far today. We know that many of you were helped and encouraged by the testimony that we shared last weekend. So we've got another one that we want to share with you today. Now I've got on a Zoom call with me, Clayton and Natasha. And Clayton, you've had many health challenges. Why don't you tell us about that and the treatment that you receive every week? I've been diagnosed with lupus for the past 10 years. And my lupus has been in, in remission for the past eight years. Last year, during some routine blood tests, my doctor picked out that my blood levels were not right. He found out that my blood was fragmenting. So I had to go on dialysis last year in July. I go for treatment twice a week for four hour sessions. Now, your medication is the same medication that's been used to treat COVID-19. Have you been impacted by the supply of that at all? We're so grateful to God that in a season where there's such a shortage of this medication, Cajun actually has um, an added supply, shall I say, of this medication. Medicaid made a bit of an error and they actually gave us double the dosage. So he's because he's been, his lupus has been in remission, Instead of having to take it every day, he only has to take it three times a week. Now, you, you were supposed to attend the men's conference, but on the day of men's conference, your doctor called to say that your white blood cell count was dangerously low and you had to be hospitalized. While I was in hospital, I had a blood specialist come and see me. I had an infection specialist come and see me and my specialist was treating me. And uh, between these three specialists, they just could not figure out what was going on because my blood results said something else. It said that I should be sick. I uh, should be weak. My body color should not be what it is. It should, I should be pale. I should not be eating. But I was normal. I love the fact that God has provided for your health needs, but He's also provided for your financial needs because as soon as you came out of hospital, you landed a significant job. So in that week, just before lockdown, he was able to do so much of work for his business that he was able to actually have five months worth of income just in a matter of four weeks. And, you know, we made a decision as a couple that during this year that Clayton was in and out of hospital and in, in July last year when he was there for like 20 days, we remained faithful, we gave our tithes, we carried on serving in Kids Zone and God has been so amazingly faithful to us. And when you see the God's house, God comes through and sees to your house. Now speaking about houses, you guys had been trying to sell your home for over a year and around the same time you finally managed to sell it. Not only that though, you discovered an insurance policy. Tell us more about what happened there. We were going through our paperwork just finalizing everything, getting everything ready for the estate agent. And then I came across a policy and uh, in this policy, I, I had critical illness cover. So uh, I read through it and I found out, wow, this uh, covers me for my kidney failure. So I filled in the form, sent it through to the bank and then they got back to me within two days. And they said, well, we will cover your, your bond payment. We will pay your bond for 18 months. I like the saying by Pastor Andre, don't look at what life is doing, look at what God is doing. So we're so grateful that we are looking at what God is doing in our life. There's so much going around us right now. People are worried about finances. They are worried about their health because of the COVID-19. But we are grateful that we are not worried about that. We are looking at what God is doing in our life. Clayton, Natasha, thank you so much for sharing your story today. We know that people have been encouraged by what you've had to share. Church, we trust that you have been inspired to know that if God can do it for them, He can do it for you. Let's continue to enjoy the service today. As we come around the teaching today, I'm coming to you from my study. How unusual is it to preach from our study where I pray and I prepare? But I'm very excited about today's message 
and I hope it'll change your perspective and it'll encourage you. I was reading this book recently, a Swedish author by the name of Hans Rosling, and uh, the book's called Factfulness, 10 Reasons We're Wrong About the World. And he goes around interviewing people, and this is what he says. He says, every group of people I ask thinks the world is more frightening, more violent, more hopeless, more dramatic than it really is. Critical thinking is always difficult, he says, but it's almost impossible when we are scared. You see, your emotions affect your perspective, and the way you look at life is often governed by the way you feel, but that can distort your perceptions. So we've got to be very careful how we look at the world, because most people see the world negatively. Again, a man called Steve Denning, an author who wrote an article in the Forbes magazine, it was called Why the World is Getting Better and Why Hardly Anyone Knows About It. He said, when a recent survey asked, all things considered, do you think the world is getting better or worse? The results were predictably bleak. He said in Sweden, only 10% thought things were getting better. And in the US, it was only 6%. Then he made this comment, hardly anyone thinks the world is getting better. But I want to declare to you today, it is the world is not getting worse. It's just our perspective of life that's actually deteriorating. Things are often not what you think they are. And two people can look at exactly the same situation and see it differently. Have a look at this video with me at this Lamborghini. And you can see how wrong our perceptions really are sometimes. As you can see, things are not what they seem. It's all about perception. And our perceptions need to be like God's perceptions. We need to be looking at life, our country, and our world from God's point of view. That's why I want to speak to you today from the practical title, Cultivating a God Perspective. Because a God perspective is not natural. It has to be cultivated. Our natural reaction is to engage the world and to be negative about it. I'm sure many of you have heard the illustration over and over of the blind people who examined an elephant and then gave a report of what they thought the beast was really like. Well, just think of it. The person right at the back must have really thought this is a stinky thing. I don't really know what it looks like, but sure, it stinks. And I think a lot of people engage the world and their perception is life stinks. The world stinks. But that's not true. Two people looking at the same thing can see it differently if one is looking from God's perspective. Now, there's a passage of scripture that's well known, so don't switch off, where Jesus takes the disciples onto a lake. Same situation, two different responses because of perception. So let's read here from Mark chapter 4 and verse 35. And I'd like to call it this, Jesus and the majority, because it was Jesus and the 12. They outnumbered him. Let's read it. It says, that day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. There was also other boats with him. Now, this is life. A furious squall came up. In other words, dangerous things happen, even when you're walking with Jesus. And it says here, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. These were fishermen facing storm conditions, dangerous conditions, and it was probably natural to become a little bit unnerved. It says Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him, that's all of them it seems, and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? They probably thought, what do you mean, why? And then he said, do you still have no faith? Almost implying they should have faith at a level to deal with storms 
by now having been around him. And it says they were terrified and they asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. I want you to realize today the same storm that caused panic in the lives of the disciples made Jesus drowsy. The same storm that in their eyes caused panic and fear put Jesus to sleep. Same situation, two completely different perceptions. And let me remind you, 12 of them felt fear and panic and complained, but 12 were wrong. One man was right. And when you see things from God's perspective, fear does not rule your life. So how do we cultivate a God perspective when we're in a storm like we're in now? Let me give you six things. Number one, the first thing to do to cultivate a God perspective is this. Cultivate your faith, not your fears. You've got to cultivate your faith. You've got to build it up by studying the word. Romans 10 and verse 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Jesus would have spoken to them and told them we're going to the other side. We're not going to try. Let's hope we can get to the other side. He would have declared it and they would have had to base their faith on his word. You constantly have to confront your fears and look at life through the lens of faith. You see life differently. Yes, I see the reality. I see the problem. I see the danger. I see the death. However, I'm looking at it from God's perspective. Faith does that, and you have to cultivate that. It's not natural. It's natural to panic, and it's natural to fear. I want to remind you, the world is not getting worse. Actually, it's getting better. But pessimistic attitudes are increasing because we're constantly being fed negative reports and negative news. And if we constantly fed that, it's not surprising that we're looking from a human, natural, negative, pessimistic view at our world. Our world is a great place to live. Its values might sometimes be completely wrong and uh, they're not in line with God's, but the world itself God created and he's actually on an upward trajectory, not on a downhill slope. And we have to see it through the lens of faith. You know, it's so interesting. I was just reading recently about how perspective can be distorted when it comes to global warming and emissions. You know, you'd think we were about to fry and die. But I read this and it shocked me that Canada... That first world country, their CO2 emissions, listen to this, are twice as high as China's and eight times as high as India's. You see, it's perception. You'd think they were streets ahead and those third world countries were far behind. But perception is often not reality. And you have to look at things through the eye of reality. You also have to look at them through the eye of faith. So feed your faith and starve your fears. Number two, the second way to cultivate our God perspective, we read from the story, is this. Avoid victim or blame mentality. You know, as soon as things go wrong in life, people start to look for someone to blame. And the disciples did exactly that. They turned around and they pointed at Jesus. Don't you care that we are drowning? You know, what's the matter with you? And that instinct that kicks in, that fear instinct, we always look for some, it's the government's fault that we're struggling and there's so many people dying and now there's a lockdown and if they had caught it sooner and if Donald Trump had listened to so and so and so and so, we wouldn't be in this position. We all follow like sheep and point fingers and begin to blame people instead of looking at things through the lens of faith and looking at God. It's so easy to get into that victim mentality. I'm a victim of circumstances. I'm a victim of COVID-19. What's happening to our world? What's happening to our country? What's happening to my business? No, no, no. You're living in an incredible world and we're going through a temporary storm and storms come to pass and we need to build our faith and we mustn't point fingers and blame and become victims. It's so easy. Jesus said to them, why are you afraid? What's the matter with you? You're still so small in faith. In other words, your faith should grow you beyond victim mentality. And it's so easy for us to get gripped by circumstances. You know, Jacob, when Joseph was eventually uh, taken to Egypt and the boys followed and began to buy grain from him, the story in Genesis is quite long, but to, to abbreviate today, it says the boys went and bought from their brother, not knowing who he was. And the last time they went, they said, he, he said to them, bring Benjamin back with you. So they came to their father and they said, he wants Benjamin, not knowing who Joseph was. 
And, and, and that, that, that looking at it from an earthly perspective, Jacob, Israel, prince with God, chosen one, the one who had a destiny, he says this in the book of Genesis chapter 42. Jacob said to them, you have deprived me of my children. Joseph is no more and Simeon is no more. And now you want to take Benjamin. Everything is against me. That's not a God perspective. You blame. I'm a victim. Everything's against me. He didn't realize actually that Joseph was alive. He was the prince of Egypt and that he would see Simeon again and that they'd all end up living there in prosperity and in provision. But his perception was negative. And we end up looking for people to blame, point fingers, but that's not what we should be doing right now. Keep a positive spirit and keep your eyes on God. The third way to cultivate a God perspective is this. See things as Jesus sees them. Jesus was not phased by the storm. He was not overwhelmed. He didn't say, good, I'm glad you woke me up. This is a serious situation. Send me that email. Let's share those negative emails. Man, I didn't know those facts. No, we need to see storms like Jesus sees storms. And he sees them differently. He saw it was just a storm that he had authority over that would come to pass. And we need to see this COVID-19 in exactly the same way. From a faith perspective, not a victim perspective, not trying to find someone to blame. And from a perspective that says, you know what? Jesus has got his eye on this thing. I'm looking at this from heaven. God's in control and I'm not going to be phased. You know, fear always exaggerates everything. But faith sees things for what they are and sees them as God sees them. When you study scripture, you'll see that Jesus always saw things differently to other people. Jesus came across a little girl of 12 years old who had died, Jairus' daughter. And Jairus said, would you come to my house and would you, would you heal my daughter? But I want you to notice the response here. We need to see as he sees because we mustn't see as the majority sees. And the scripture says here in Luke chapter 8, when he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him, watch this, except Peter, James, and John. And the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She is not dead, but asleep. Now notice, they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. You see, people know so much. They know everything. But they only know on an earthly plane. Jesus knew something they didn't know. He saw something they couldn't see. But the scripture goes on to say, that uh, he took her by the hand and he said, my child, get up. You see, it's so easy for us to follow with the herd, to mourn and wail and cry. But when we see what Jesus sees, something can look dead. It can look disastrous. It can look like it's deepening. But Jesus sees there's going to be deliverance. And we must see things from his perspective. We need to go through storms with the perspective of the master, not with the perspective of the majority. And let them laugh at us if they want to. We need to see through the eye of faith. This world isn't such a horrible place. There are storms that come. But on the whole, it's pretty amazing. And here Jesus looks at something and he doesn't see death. He sees healing. He sees possibilities. He sees her growing up. He sees life. He sees a breakthrough. He sees a new beginning. And we have to see as Jesus sees. It's so, so important. And you know, Jesus was affected by unbelief. He only took Peter, James, and John in with him. And the people that are closest to you affect your perspective. Remember that. If you get a lot of people around you who only see death, you're not going to be buoyed up and see from God's perspective. C.S. Lewis made this amazing remark in his book, The Magician's Nephew. He said this, what you see and what you hear depends a great deal on where you're standing. It also depends on what sort of person you are. You see, who you are and where you are will depend how you see. Is your mind in heavenly places or are you down in the earth buried with a whole lot of negative people around you? Your perception it will be affected by the people around you. Jesus went to his hometown and he couldn't do miracles there because the people didn't believe in him and were negative. It's so important for us not to get this worldview that everyone around us has. What's your perception today? Is it doom and gloom? And we're going to hell in a handbasket, as they say in America? No, we need to look from the eye and the perspective of faith and realize even if a thing looks dead, it can live again. 
You know, I was reading this week that around the world, violence, disease, and poverty are lessening. For most people, that's like, can't be. But it's true. People are living longer and better than they did 100 years ago. It's a fact. But the perception is global warming, emissions, all these things, killing the planet, plastic everywhere. You don't know how long we're going to survive. The end is coming. It's actually not true. God sees this planet with a future, with blessing. He's still got much to do to it. He's still going to bless it, and he's going to bless the people on it. And we are going to get through this thing if we see with the eye of faith. Did you know that global poverty rates are actually declining? I read that in 1820, 94% of the world was penniless. Unbelievable. And, uh, and yet today, look at the prosperity. Listen to this. 88% in India are no longer destitute or living in poverty like they used to. Today, it's only 10%. In China, in the 90s, that's not so long ago, 50% of people were living in poverty. Today in China, it's only 1%. We need to see what Jesus sees. This world is not getting worse. It's actually getting better. This world is not dead. Actually, it has a lot of life in it, and we need to believe. Listen to this. It's, it's just 20 years ago that 29% of the world's population lived in poverty. But today that figure is only 9%. That's pretty amazing. And world hunger is down from 23% right down to 12.9%. More people are eating. We're living longer. Standards of living are increasing. Don't listen to the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. Even if people in banks and, and investment tell you that. It is not the truth. The stats don't bear it up. And it's not looking at it from God's point of view. The world is not run by ruthless capitalists and warmongering nations hell-bent on destroying us. So we need to start seeing like Jesus sees. Number four, the fourth way we can cultivate a heavenly perspective is to cultivate positive perspectives of negative situations. When Jesus looked at a dead girl, he saw her potential, even though Everyone was declaring her dead. We need to look at negative situations and see the positive in them. Look at your world and start looking at it differently. You know, in the early part of the 20th century, a shoe company in America wanted to get into the African market. And so they sent a salesman over to the Congo. When he got there, he sent a telegram back. No prospects here. No one wears shoes. Well, another company in the States had also got wind of this and sent their salesman over. And he sent a telegram back. Prospects are amazing. No one wears shoes. What an opportunity for sales. You know, you can, you can see and hear the same thing, but you receive it differently. And when you've got Christ living in you and you look at things from the eye of faith, you start to see the positive in negative situations. Now, CBS News had a little morning segment where they played a, a recording of a word, and they say, if you're a younger person, you hear this word. If you're an older person, you hear that word. It's exactly the same when people look at something. They see it differently. Watch this clip. People all over the world are listening to this and arguing about it. Do you hear Yanni or Laurel? Laurel. 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 How does anybody hear Laurel out of that? We're going to discuss. What? Guys, do you hear Yanny or do you hear Laurel? Mark Minioff, you go first. I hear Yanny. What does it mean? Okay. Oh. Charlie, what do you hear? Charlie Laurel. Jeter? Laurel. Laurel. <laughs> Dr. Samson Davis, what do you hear? Obviously, uh, it's Yanny. If mm. you're younger, you hear Yanny. If you're older, you tend to hear Laurel. It all has to do with higher, your higher well, frequency. There goes that. Can you see how you can hear the same word, either Yanny or Laurel, depending on who you are. That's how perception works. And I think often we're fed such negative news that it shapes the way we see everything. We see everything from a negative point of view. But actually, the world is not as bad as it seems. And we've got to be careful what we are fed. Because you've got to remember, bad news sells. They have a saying, if it bleeds, it leads. In other words, the top story of the day has got to be negative. And we read about all the negatives. I, I read last year that, uh, you know, in the airline industry, it was quite fascinating, 40 million airline flights took off and landed. 40 million. 
but none of them made the news, only the 10 that crashed. And the 10 that crashed, isn't this amazing? They make up 0.00025% of the total. You see, safe flights don't make news. We have to start looking at negative situations and seeing the positive in them because that's looking from a God perspective. Hans Rosling, the Swedish author, said this. He said, forming your worldview by relying on the media would be like forming your view about me by looking only at a picture of my foot. Here's the paradox. The image of a dangerous world has never been broadcast more effectively than it is now, while the world has never been less violent and more safe than it actually is now. But because we see more news, we think it's going down the tubes when it isn't. Fantastic book I just read, and I so enjoyed it, by a Christian author called J.D. King. He speaks a lot and writes a lot on healing, but he titled the book, Why You've Been Duped Into Believing That the World Is Getting Worse. In other words, you've been lied to. And he mentions statistic after statistic. I want to give it to you today because it's going to help you and inspire you. Because it's amazing what the book says. He records that the FBI released a report recently stating that homicides in the world have dropped by 50% in the last 25 years. Who would have thought that? You think the world is becoming more and more violent. He also said that rapes have declined. Listen to this. 80% in America from 1995 to 2010. Then he says, of 88 countries who hand in their stats, 67 of them reported fewer homicides over the last 40 years. The world's not getting more violent, and we're just seeing it as more violent. It's actually getting better. Then he says that illnesses and diseases are better managed, and our life expectancy has increased significantly. Global child mortality rates have plummeted from 40% 120 years ago right down to today to 0.05%. They're managing to, people are managing to give birth. They're managing to live longer through good health. We actually need to see our world for what it really is. Max Rosa, he's a researcher at Oxford University, wonderful young man, and he founded a company called Our World in Data. They collect data and they analyze facts. And this is what he says about life expectancy. He says, estimates suggest that in a pre-modern poor world, life expectancy was around 30 years in all regions. 30 years old was how long you expected to live. But then he says, since 1900, the global average life expectancy has more than doubled and is now 70 years. Isn't that incredible? Since just 1900. And then he says, in 2019, the country with the lowest life expectancy in the Central African Republic was 53 years. But in Japan, life expectancy is 30 years longer. So that would make it 53 plus 30 would be 83. But actually in Japan, in 2020, the life expectancy has actually gone up, and the figure now is 84.5. So we're living much longer. Why is it that we feel the world is such a terrible place? I love this book because it just so inspired me. He said, yeah, terrorism is the biggest fear most people have. And we don't worry about conventional war because we believe the military can help us. But when it comes to terrorism, it grips us with fear. Bombs in the street, bombs in the malls. And yet, if you look at the world... Do you know that of all the deaths in the world, 0.05 are from radical extremism? 0.05. If you think of America, and it's, and it's sad to say this, in America, 3,172 people have died from terrorism in the last 20 years. Now, that sounds dreadful, and it is dreadful for those who've died. But if you look at that figure in 20 years, you know, not a lot of people have actually, there's only 159 people a year. And the Boston Marathon bombers only killed three people. Terrible thing that they did, but only three people. But the fear that it evokes makes it a much bigger issue than it really is. And we end up living in fear. 3,100 and something people in America have died in 20 years. However, listen to this. 1.4 million people die every year in America from alcohol abuse. It's amazing how we get our perspective skewed. We have to begin to see this world as God sees it instead of seeing it as the newscasters or the naysayers or the activists who want to strike fear into our hearts. Johan Norberg is a Swedish historian. He said this in a book called Progress, 
10 reasons to look forward to the future. And he said this, so it seems that the only way for terrorists to win is if its victims overreact, dismantle civil liberties, and blame whole groups for the actions of a few. You see, they know how to get us to become afraid. And fear distorts your perspective. Let's just take a moment to think about South Africa. All of us are in lockdown, and we're experiencing the coronavirus. Now, some 27 people have died in our country. Very sad for those families and individuals, their loved ones. But 27 people isn't actually a lot. And if you think of the fear that's in people's hearts, do you know that 14,000 people died in road accidents in 2014? So 14,000, but no one says anything. Are we going to lock down cars? Are we going to lock down the traffic every Easter and every Christmas? No, we're not, because we see life more beautifully. We believe that travel is still good. Life is still good. But with the coronavirus, there's come an unbelievable panic. And we're no longer seeing this world as our Savior sees it. We're seeing it through the eyes of fear. You know, the Spanish influenza that racked the world way back in 1918, 1919, they say 40 to 70 million people died. And I think a lot of people are thinking, ah, that's what's going to happen with the coronavirus. Millions of people are going to die. Well, the World Health Organization did an analysis and they said this, if a pandemic breaks out, this is what they say, and we don't react swiftly and we don't do anything, this is what they estimate, 1.9 million people worldwide would die. They said that before coronavirus. Because medical care is so good today, and our standard of living is so high, but you'd think millions and millions and tens of millions of people are going to die. And I've even heard people promote figures that are completely inaccurate because they're not seeing from a God perspective. We have to begin to see the truth and the reality of the world we're living in. Let me remind you, because people wrongly assume today that, that illnesses are getting worse, you know, and, and bacteria and viruses and this whole world is decaying. No, it's actually not. We're living at a much better level than we've ever lived. Smallpox has virtually been eradicated. You know, it wasn't long ago in the 50s that there were 10.5 million lepers. Now there are only 200,000 left in the world. Things are improving. You know, people say, well, they're global emissions and, and, you know, you drive a motor car and it gives off gases and that's what's killing all of us. Actually, you need to go back to 1900. Do you know that in 1900 in New York City, horses were, were, were clopping through the streets and 1.1 million kilograms of manure were being dropped on the streets and over 280,000 liters of urine every day were on the streets of New York City. I think it's got a lot better than those days. But it all depends on your perception. If you think the world is worse, well, for you, it'll be worse. But if you think it's better, then certainly it'll be better. Do you know there hasn't been a major famine in the world in the last 25 years, except in Africa? And the reason? Because of war. Not because of global warming, or because the world is deteriorating, or because the air is changing. No, it's because of war. And food production has actually increased 300% using the same land by introducing nitrogen and improving farming methods. So we're feeding more people than ever before. And let me remind you, the population has grown from 3 billion in 1960, 58 years later, to 7.5 billion in 2018, and yet we're still feeding people. In fact, the problem is not a lack of food, it's actually obesity. We've got too much to eat. Let's begin to see from God's perspective instead of seeing from the majority perspective and the negative perspective. Number five, I hope this is helping you and encouraging you today to see life from God's perspective. Stop seeing what's wrong with the world. Start seeing what's right. We must start looking at all the good in the world and start seeing the wonderful things that are happening. I've mentioned a whole lot of them. You know, the World Health Organization just recently said that 90% of the world has access to clean drinking water. Isn't that amazing? But if you watch the newscasts, you'd think the whole world is dying and people are being deprived and here we are sitting in rich countries and we don't care. It's actually not true. Everyone's standard of living is going up and this world is not such a bad place despite a short period of lockdown and the coronavirus that's threatening us. But let me remind you, it's a storm that's come to pass and so we must not see what's wrong with the world. Let's begin to see what's right with it. 
let me remind you, it's not so long ago where we had the civil rights movement and people were discriminated against. Apartheid is gone. You say, well, there's still racism. Yes, there is. Sadly, there is. But it's very, very much improved. And we now have a country run by a black majority government. Let's not see what's right with South Africa, not what's wrong with South Africa. Let's not cry all the time over things. Let's see how it's improved. I was watching Netflix, and I watched an amazing movie called Uppity. And it's the story of a black racing driver who started his career way back in 1975, Willie T. Ribs. Do you know how hard it was for him to get a drive in those days in the South of America? Men would call him terrible names and he wasn't allowed to drive. Mechanics wouldn't work on his car, but he persevered. And you know, the world's changed. Eventually, he was the first black driver to test a Formula One car. In the end, he, he rode in the Indy 500 uh, way back in 1991. It took years and years and years. But think of it today. Lewis Hamilton, he is a man of color, respected by white and black alike. Five times champion, let me remind you, Mercedes in Formula One. That's how the world has changed. Let's start seeing what's right with it, not what's wrong with it. And you know, people have said to me over the years, yeah, you know, certain religions are growing and Christianity is no longer the prominent religion. And you know, uh, people are no longer turning to God. Well, I read a fan fantastic book that I want to quote to you today, Joel Rosenberg. It's called Inside the Revival. And you know, he says that uh, since the year 2000, one million Sudanese have turned to Christ. Because of the war and the hunger and the pain, one million Sudanese, and now in Sudan, 5.5 million people call themselves Christians. Not nominal, believing Christians. And Christianity is now the fastest growing religion in the world, according to factual data, not emotion, factual data. Let me tell you a few things here. Did you know that in 1900 in Africa, there were only 8.7 million African Christians. It is estimated that right now there are 475 million and that they're projected to reach 670 million by 2025. The gospel is going out there. Let's start seeing what's good about the world. And since 1900, listen to this, in Latin America, the gospel and Christianity has grown by 877%. I believe God doesn't just see the negative, he sees the positive. You say, well, you're not a realist, you know, you need to call it what it is. No, 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 that's what the majority does. And I want to just say here, when the Lord looked at the land of Canaan, he didn't call it what it was. He saw a positive in a negative situation. When he sent Israel in, he sent spies in. Twelve spies went in. Guess what? Ten of them saw the negative. And only two of them saw the positive. God saw potential. He saw a homeland for his people. He saw mining and gold and precious stones and farming and wealth and fruit. And God sent them in. But guess what? The majority, 10 of them came out with a negative spirit. And you know what they did? The Bible says this, they brought a bad report. And in Deuteronomy, Moses says that bad report causes the people's hearts to melt. And it was those same people with a bad report that were destroyed by a plague. You know why? Because they exaggerated everything. They exaggerated the negative. Instead of seeing it from God's perspective, they saw it from a negative perspective. We need to start seeing the good in the world. Number six, as we come to a close today, live in expectation and give thanks for a bright future. Let's not let this situation we're going through make us feel that life is completely bad. I love what Oswald Chambers said. He said, never make a principle out of an experience. Now, there's just an experience we're going through. Let's not build our whole lives on this premise. Let's start living in expectation because that's how God is. He sees beyond. And let's expect a bright, bright future. We're going somewhere. We're going to get through this. Things are going to get better. And we're going to get through to the other side. And I want to encourage you if, if, you, if you're negatively focused, you won't have a positive expectation and you won't be able to give thanks. People who are negative don't give thanks, they complain. They swear, they curse, and they complain. That's why I believe all the movies today is just swearing and cursing because we see life negatively. But a Christian doesn't speak like that because he has an expectation. She has an expectation of a brighter future. And the Bible tells us here in Ephesians chapter 5, it's not fitting for you to use language which is obscene, profane, or vulgar. But watch, rather, you should give thanks. You see, you should be positively focused, speaking positively, looking from God's perspective and saying, you know what? Good things are up 
ahead. As I close today, I want to quote from C.S. Lewis, who in 1948 was approached by a group of people and asked, what's it like now to live in the atomic age? Because they entered the atomic age with the atomic bomb being dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And uh, people were wondering, what's going to happen to the world, you know? And they were negatively focused, and they had, they had no expectation. And I want to read to you as I close today what he said, what advice he gave. He said, in one way, we think a great deal too much of the atomic bomb. How are we to live in an atomic age? I'm tempted to reply, why? As you would have lived in the 16th century when the plague visited London almost every year. Or as you would have lived in a Viking age when raiders from Scandinavia might land and cut your throat any night. Or indeed, as you're already living in an age of cancer, an age of syphilis, an age of paralysis, an age of air raids, an age of railway accidents, an age of motor accidents. In other words, what's the difference? Then he says, in other words, do not let us begin by exaggerating the novelty of our situation. He says, this is the first point to be made and the first action to be taken is to pull ourselves together. If we are all going to be destroyed by an atomic bomb, well, let that bomb, when it comes, find us doing sensible and human things. Praying, working, teaching, reading, listening to music, bathing the children, playing tennis, chatting to our friends over a pint and a game of darts, not huddled together like frightened sheep thinking about bombs. They may break our bodies, and a microbe can do that, but they need not dominate our minds. I want you to have your mind filled with the things of God the perspective of God and to have not allow this situation that we're going through, this principle to become our reality. We need to see as God sees and we need to see our good future and we need to stop living in fear. I want to pray with you today as I close and I sense that there could be many, many people who are gripped by fear. Maybe the fear of death is the thing that you worry about most. It could be you're not sure where you're going to after you die. You know, when you know Jesus, you see everything from a heavenly perspective. I'm here. If it gets bad, I die. I go there. It's better. That's what Christians feel. Maybe you don't have that assurance. Maybe today you need to invite Jesus into your life. Because when you do, it's like having him in your boat. And you know what? When the storms come, he speaks peace, be still. And he gets us to the other side. So if you today say, you know what? I don't know Jesus. Well, I'm not sure where I stand with him as a Christian. Let me pray with you now. And join me in prayer and say amen. And we together can go to God. Come, let's pray. Father, we thank you today that we can come to you. And that you're the God who saves us, embraces us, forgives us. And gives us a new life and a new perspective. Come into my life today and change me, free me, heal me and make me a child of God. And Lord, speak to my life and say, peace be still. And give me a confidence that when I die... I'm going to heaven. I thank you for eternal life and the gift of God. I don't, I don't deserve it and I can't earn it. So I thank you for it today in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, there we go. Our time is up and it takes so long, but I hope you've enjoyed the chunk of teaching and I hope you've benefited today. And if you prayed, go on our website. You'll see this information that'll come up on the screen, how you can make a journey with us because you've made a decision. We'd love you to walk with God and to grow in the things of God. Until next time, we'll see you online again. And even though the church isn't meeting in buildings, it's meeting in homes and God's still doing a work in us. See everything from a positive perspective. Thank you.